Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Geopolitical Futures podcast. It has been a while, but now we're going to get back on a regular schedule. And joining me is Mr. Xander Snyder from sunny L.A. Is that where we are, Xander? It's very sunny. Very sunny. It's always sunny in L.A. And I'm here in Austin, Texas. And today we are going to be talking about, I don't know, do I even want to use the word, Xander? We're going to be talking about the words climate change. Oh, my oh. God. Yeah. Yikes. And this is a topic that I think we've avoided speaking about on the podcast and writing about uh, because as Xander and I were just talking about, climate change means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And it's been used politically to espouse certain viewpoints, whether you want to see you know, action taken against you know, oil or fossil fuels or these sorts of things, or you want, you know, pollution to be capped at certain levels. And I mean, Xander, I don't know how you feel about this, but I sort of hate that whole debate because the point is not whether there is climate change or whether it is man-made. Obviously, the climate is constantly changing. And obviously, every single organism on the planet has a role in changing how the environment and how the climate goes from time to time. I think the interesting thing is to try and say, okay, are there instances where the climate is changing or where humans are speeding up processes that might have discrete political outcomes? And I feel like so often when we talk about climate change, we get stuck in the sort of the, the previous political conversation rather than in the actual ramification. Yeah, exactly. And there, there is quite a lot of research out there that can at the very least point us in the direction of where we're going to see some of the largest geopolitical impact from changes in the climate. And that's kind of how we're going to approach it on this particular podcast is to start to start to think out loud about how we can go about answering some of these questions a little bit more specifically based on the information that's there. And neither of us are, you know, climate experts or environmental scientists, but we are experts in geopolitics. And with a little bit of direction, we can start to see where some of these flashpoints are going to arise in the next 10 to 20 years. Yeah, and one one thing that's been really interesting to me, and I'm I'm already going a little off topic about what we said we were going to talk about, but I've I rediscovered this paper that was written by a professor who I think I think is at the University of Oregon. I hope I didn't get that wrong. Named Aaron Wolf, and it's a really interesting paper because he basically well he does two things. Number one, he goes back for the past roughly fifty years, and he looks at all the different conflicts in the world that you could ascribed to being conflicts over water. So over the depletion of water or over the competition over water resources or how water resources are changing over time. And he actually finds um, that most of the time when it comes to water conflict, the issue is not with interstate conflict. Most of the time, water conflict is actually solved by treaties or by cooperation or by negotiations. It's, it's actually an anomaly for water issues to lead to conflict. And he even in the study, he did you know three years of research with other with other folks at the University of Oregon, and they found that there was really only one war in all of human history, going back to like something in the cradle of civilization in the Tigris and Euphrates, where there was a war that was specifically over water resources. I think the place where water matters a lot more is in the internal stability of countries, um, and I think you see that in a country like Syria, because I think a lot of what happened in the Syrian civil war started because you had a drought and that meant that farmers couldn't grow crops and then they were moving into cities and they didn't have jobs and so you had a ready-made base to revolt. You've seen the same sort of dynamic in Sudan and then another place where this is becoming apparent right now is India. Yeah, well, I've looked into the issue of Iran uh, and Iran's water resources in a fair amount of de more detail than India, which is I know is something that you're starting to dig into a little bit, but um, there are similarities between some of the water scarcity issues that we're seeing in Iran right now and the ones in Syria. It's a combination of um, policies that encouraged um, overproduction of certain types of particularly thirsty crop like wheat, which led to, because these, these crops were subsidized by the government and sometimes the cost of producing those crops, including pumping water or groundwater from from underground, uh, because that was subsidized by the government, uh, you got over depletion of a lot of those groundwater resources. So as some of that land became um, not arable, especially in combination with droughts and more extreme weather patterns, you got a lot of people moving from these rural communities to cities. And you know, if you have to upend your life 
you're probably not happy about it. And that was at least one element that helped give rise to some of the Syrian civil war um, issues immediately preceding it. And it's we're seeing at least echoes of that in Iran right now. But in, in terms of India, this propped up, uh, popped up on one of our daily memos the other day, uh, scarcity in the city of Chennai. What are you seeing there, Jacob? Well, it's funny. Before I answer that question, I, I was going to put a question to you because I think you were, I forgot to bring up Iran and I know you've been looking at it. And for listeners, Xander wrote a really, really excellent deep dive piece about what's going on with Iran water. But I think the question I'm going to ask you is going to be very relevant to what we're going to talk about with India too, which is to say, what role do you think change in climate is playing when it comes to Iran's water crisis? And what role has to do with government mismanagement of resources or just population increases and the population of Iran being too uh, growing too fast for the resources that Iran has? Are both of those things happening at the same time? Is it the type of issue that if Iran had better overall management, there wouldn't be an issue at all? Or in Iran, do you see that climate change is really affecting the underlying fundamentals and changing the reality that the Iranian government has to deal with? It definitely seems like both, because up until this point, much of the reason that you're seeing over extraction of groundwater is because of government policies that, especially after the 1979 re revolution, tri Iran tried to become self-sufficient, um, food self-sufficient, and not and have to rely less on food imports, and that is why they began subsidizing production of certain crops that were thirstier crops, and whenever you provide subsidies, you generally see an over usage of whatever the inputs are because it costs less to produce that good. So that's definitely a big part of it. But as time go goes on, we're seeing an increase in extreme weather, weather patterns in Iran like floods. And floods are not new to Iran, but as you s we see greater incidents of drought, which has been going on and more severe drought, then floods kind of are part and parcel of that because the ground can't absorb water as quickly, and extreme and a greater freak uh, incidence of extreme weather patterns is one of the things that pretty much all the literature on climate change in Iran specifically predicts. And in fact, we're already seeing it. So it's not they're not predictions anymore. They are predictions that were made that are happening. And that it's just that the frequency of those weather patterns are supposed to increase as time goes on. And this is not even dealing with the rise in temperature, which is generally consistent across all the research that, that I read. Although some seem to indicate that in certain regions, the temperature might be might not increase that much and the rainfall might be about the same. It varies a little bit more paper by paper, but all of them are anticipating greater, greater weather patterns or greater extreme weather patterns, which can make certain parts of Iran less habitable. So they both play into it. Yeah. And I, I think that's such a great point because it, it gets back to what I said at the beginning, because I feel like the language here that we're going to use is going to be picked apart so much. And I'm, I'm just going to focus it. I'm going to focus on it a little bit as we talk, because again, how do, how do we describe what you are what language would we use to describe the reality that you just talked about, right? Is that just weather patterns are changing? Is that climate change? Is that man-made climate change? Is it not man-made climate change? Like none of that actually matters so much as the fact is that you are seeing weather patterns in Iran that are outside the norm that this particular government or this particular population has gotten used to dealing with. And that's going to have I mean, in the case of Iran, I think you predicted that it's going to have consequences in terms of the government's ability to assert control. That's right. Yeah. And it's going to force the Iranian government to spend more on things like building out new water infrastructure that, you know, can either take desalinated water inland or can better conserve water resources so they don't evaporate or seep back into the ground in certain areas before they're used, stuff like that. And of course, Iran's budget is very, it's stretched very thin right now. This is something we've written on about a bunch. So if you have to divert more resources towards infrastructure to ensure that your population can drink, or more accurately, that you can provide water to the agricultural industry, then you have less money to spend on other things. Yeah, I think the issue of, I'm only just sort of starting to understand just how, how radical water desalination could be. Um, right now, it's still really, really expensive to desalinate water. And really, the only places where you can do it you you have to have a couple dynamics to make water desalination even affordable, right? Like you have to have no other choice 
you have to have, um, if usually if you look at the studies, you have to be sort of in a coastal environment at low ele- elevations. You, you can't be transporting the, the water over large distances. And generally people have to be using it for drinking water. But it's interesting to think about water, uh, about water desalination technology because I feel like so much of geopolitical thinking is about river systems. If you're looking in the Middle East, like who controls the Nile is hugely important for the overall geopolitics of you know, Northern Africa and all these other things. When you're looking at Europe, uh, it's, it's all about the Danube, right? And who's getting to control different parts of, of the Danube. That's true also if you go further east. If you go back down into the cradle of civilization, we're talking about the Tigris and the Euphrates. So I don't know why I started talking about water desalination, desalination but it seems to me that you know, if you're just thinking about it in the abstract, you would think, man, if you could just desalinate water on your coast, then all these coastal countries, it doesn't really matter if they're losing water resources, they'd be able to harvest all this water from the interior. But even now with water desalination technology being around for so long, it's just, it's hugely cost prohibitive to actually engage in it. So I don't think that's going to be the type of thing that Iran is going to be able to do. And I, I think that's also where the relationship here between climate and environment and geography and government becomes so important, right? A a small country like Israel, which has a dearth of water resources, was able to commit to water desalination in a major way because they were wealthy and because they had a government that was able to make it a priority. And it was just a realistic thing for that government to implement. Whereas a country like Iran, which is so huge and so sprawling, so many different ethnic groups, not to mention political factions and all these other things, it can be very hard for them to come up with a plan that they will implement, stop any kind of climate change or weather patterns. They're probably just going to have to roll with the punches. Yeah, and in addition to desalination being extremely costly, it's also extremely energy intensive. And so for a place like Iran that does derive a fair amount of its economic productivity from the, well, decreasingly from the export of things like oil and natural gas, you would have to begin. You would have to divert a substantial amount of Iran's natural gas towards that desalination pro- process in order to derive even a small amount of potable water that you need for the population. So there are economic constraints of all different sorts, and that clearly plays into the political constraints because if you can't actually move those financial resources around, then politically you need to find other solutions. Yeah, absolutely. And and the reason I kind of brought it up is because, you know, Iran is a country of what about 80 million people, is that yeah. about right for? Yeah. When when you start thinking about India, I mean, it's literally we're, we're talking about Iran like on a completely different scale, right? Which is true of everything in India. When you start thinking about India, it almost feels like you're dealing with an alternate with an alternate universe in and of itself. And I mean, I just I've started going through at the beginning of this week and just going through some of the statistics specifically on water when it comes to India. And it's strange when you think about it, because if you think of of India, if you look at a map of India, you think about the monsoon season in India that India is famous for, there's a lot of water in India, right? Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't think that India is a country that is going to have tremendous problems with water. But honestly, like it's, it's, I mean, the statistics are mind boggling. So I was, I was reading the study that the Indian government put out recently and it predicted that by the year 2030, and the study was put out last year, so we're only one year into this prediction, but by the year 2030, the Indian government is expecting that demand for water in India is going to be twice the level of supply. And the think tank even estimated that that could equate to a 6% loss in Indian GDP um, over the course Jeez. of that time period. And when you, when you also start looking at different it's, it's, of course, it's not one unified thing in India, right? Some states are more water risk than others, but you start looking at the states that have the most water risk and they happen to be the place where, you know, over 600 million people live. They happen to be the place where some 30% of India's agriculture is current, where India's agriculture is currently carried out. Um, the, the numbers are just mind boggling. And some of it has to do, or a lot of it has to do with Indian government mismanagement, Right. Like you have different states inside of India competing over water and having disputes with each other over water. You have issues with sewage and with pollution. A lot of the water, some ridiculous percentage of the water, I forget what it was, something like 70% of the water that people are using for drinking or for planting is, is contaminated with pollution. But there's also a climate change aspect to it, and it's there in two ways. 
The first is what you alluded to with Iran, which is that you know, we don't know exactly how climate change is going to affect things. But one thing that seems to be pretty clear is that you're going to have more extremes. And in a place like India, which, re- which relies so much on a, a regular weather pattern of monsoons for four months out of the year, you know, bringing a lot of water, what you're going to have is you'll have some seasons where it's going to be even more rainy. The monsoons are going to be even more uh, monsoony, if I can use a terrible adjective, because I can't think of a better word. But then the droughts are going to be that much worse. And the city that you alluded to in your question, um, Chennai, which is 9 million people, where the water has basically literally run out, it's because you know they're having a drought, and sometimes you're going to have droughts, but the drought is worse than it was going to be before, and the population is growing. Now, on top of that, and I think this is the more the more important one, and this is one of the ones where climate change is more specifically implicated, um, a large source of Indian water comes from glaciers in the Himalayas, and meltwater runs off and you know feeds into a lot of different river systems and all these other things inside of India. And as temperatures rise, you're seeing those glaciers melt. And what that is ironically going to mean is that over the course of the next 50 years or so, you're actually going to have more water coming into India from those systems, right? But there have been some studies that say that by the year 2100, which is a long ways away for us, we probably won't be there to see it, but 95% of the glaciers that India is getting water from are going to be gone by 2100 if things continue to increase sort of in the, in the realm that they're in now. So this is one of those cases where you know, India is just completely, it's too crowded. The government isn't managing things well and can't manage thing, things well. That's like the story of India's, India's geopolitics in a nutshell. And then on top of that, you have weather extremes affecting these different patterns and you have glaciers in the Himalayas melting. And all of that you know, tells me that you know, when I start to think about India as a country, it's really hard to think about how it's going to be able to even approach these problems, which is, I think, sort of what you were saying about Iran, too. Yeah, exactly. And the thing about the Himalayas that is, well, interesting, but also striking and concerning in the long term is, you know, it's it's not just India, right? Because Himalaya runoffs also are the water supply for rivers like the Yangtze and the Yellow River in China, which are sort of the arteries of Chinese agriculture and civiliz- uh, civilization, if you go back far enough in history. Additionally, also Pakistan gets a lot of its water from the Himalaya. So even though you cited that that article from your professor at the beginning of this conversation about how you know straight up water wars, you can't, there aren't a lot of ex- great examples of it in terms of interstate conflict. It certainly seems like you know, those three countries will have an interest in trying to secure some alternate source of water, or at least whatever remains from the Himalaya runoffs as time goes on. Yeah, and I, and I guess this is kind of, this is where it, it becomes a really difficult question to benchmark, because there are a lot of studies out there, right? And we can say things in broad terms, like weather patterns are going to get more extreme, or, you know, Indian demand for water is going to outpace supply. But it's really hard to get specific enough to, for governments to know exactly what they have to do in order to, to, to fix things. Uh, India is another great example because I don't know, if, have you ever heard of this thing called the Indian Rivers Interlink Project? No, so it apparently goes back to like when the British first got to India, they were like, man, if we could just link up some of these river systems, like India could be even more rich and powerful and a source of wealth for us than it was before, Right. And you've had sort of successive generations, first of British leaders in India and then Indian leaders themselves, who wanted to try and use all of India's different river systems to connect them in, in sort of, you know, think of the way that in the United States, the Illinois waterway system, right, interlinks a bunch of rivers and lakes and canals that allows you to ship things from the Great Lakes to the Gulf of Mexico via the Mississippi River. That has been a source of tremendous power, uh, economic power and geopolitical advantage for the United States theoretically, that's the sort of thing that if you just put politics to the side, a country like India could do that. And if India could you know, sort of build the infrastructure necessary for that, it could be sitting on this immense, immensely powerful situation because then you could start to use you know, the places where there's more water in India. Maybe you can get the, them to the places where there's less water in India and maybe you can make the shocks of these changing weather patterns easier and all these other things. And of course, you know, anybody who likes to think about logistics, though, is probably already lighting themselves on fire when they think about, well, how are you going to create the infrastructure that's going to interlink these rivers in India? Have you ever been to the Indian countryside? Do you see how they're living? Uh, 
you know, the government probably can't even do this in one Indian state, let alone in India as a country as a whole. And I think, I think that's one of the lessons here when we're starting to think about not just climate change now, but how climate and geography and topography has changed countries over time. The countries that are best able to deal with those types of changes are the ones that can marshal incredible levels of not even just political power. It's about discipline. It's about you know, having a project, seeing the project through to its end and completing it in such a way that doesn't destroy a bunch of other things. And when you look at a country like India, yeah, India is not probably not going to be able to do that if you look at, if you look at its past history. Um, Iran, I don't know. Do you think Iran has any kind of chance to, if the situation gets dire enough that the Iranian government could implement those sorts of large scale infrastructure projects or is Iran just up the Creek without a paddle? Oh boy. I think they would, if, if they were to meaningfully decrease spending in other, in other areas, then yeah, maybe they could, they could stand a chance. But it seems like the problem is when you start actually getting into like the dollar amounts necessary to build out some of this infrastructure, it's it's such a huge portion of the Iranian government's annual budget that, you know, you'd have to start not just we're not just talking about military spending. You'd have to start cutting like some of the social programs and cash subsidies that the Iranian government doles out in order to start diverting it to just one type of resource infrastructure let alone all the other types of resource infrastructure that you know any country needs. So it seems particularly problematic in in Iran because not just I mean the political willpower like you said maybe maybe in a year or two the IRGC takes more control and they can kind of more author um in a more authoritarian fashion just say what they're going to do and do it but that doesn't make economic resources magically appear, right? Yeah, for sure. And I mean this really just underscores the point. I mean, we're just talking about one very small subset um, that isn't even climate change itself, right? Like we're just talking about water as a resource and maybe some of the ways that a change in climate will affect that resource. But I think this goes back to that paper that I referenced before, because I don't think we're, we're I don't think this is going to be like Mad Max Fury Road, right? Where there's going to be like wars between post-apocalyptic gangs that are searching for water. But I do think if you want to look at countries that are particularly susceptible to internal political risks, uh, you have to start thinking in terms of access to water resources as being a major indicator of instability. Um, we're having this podcast, and I hope that people don't think that I'm ready to give a final judgment on this. I, I like using the podcast to talk about things that I'm not quite sure about in my head. It's, it's actually useful for me, and I'm sure it is for you too, Xander, to sort of talk about things out loud and try them on as we're dealing with new topics. And this is exactly what this is. But you know, just based on some of the research I've been doing on India lately, um, I got to think that a country like India is primed for major social unrest at some point because there's no way that that current political structure is going to be able to deal with some of the problems that we're seeing. And if you want to, if you want to understand what instability in a country looks like uh, when it comes to water resources. Again, I think Syria is a really good test case. And I think this has gone a little bit unnoticed. I think what's going on in Sudan right now is also a test case because I don't think it's a coincidence that you had high levels of drought in recent years in Sudan. And then boom, all of a sudden people are in the streets protesting and trying to get rid of dictators and the military is trying to put them down. I, I think a lot of that can go back to this one resource and to how climate is changing and making access to that resource in certain politically unstable parts of the world much more insecure. I think that's right. Um, well, l let me ask you this, or let me refocus the conversation a little bit, because as you mentioned that we are, we have just kind of been talking about, you know, water scarcity, but there are different elements to climate change's impact on geopolitical issues. So since we're already talking about India, let's focus in on India a little bit more. And as glaciers in the Himalayas melt and glaciers elsewhere melt, and particularly uh, the Greenland ice sheet is, is one of the, the, the glaciers with the highest rate of change of year-over-year -year melt, that you know, plays into the issue of sea level rises. And there, are, there is a fair amount of variability, as I understand it, in terms of how much people think sea level may rise over a certain amount of time, but clearly that implicates low-lying regions of the world more than others. And one of those is Bangladesh and Myanmar. Bangladesh is 
a very heavily populated country for its size. I think it's like 130 million people. I'm actually going to look that up real quick. Uh, yeah, it's about 165 million people live in Bangladesh. Um, and if you get low-lying levels of the world that are either less habitable or no longer habitable, then those people are going to have to go somewhere, right? And what we're already seeing in the northeastern regions of India and in like Assam, and this plays into some of the Hindu nationalist stuff that's been going on in India generally over the last couple of years. In Assam, they um, were basically publishing these these lists of registered citizens, people who were officially Indians and a lot... And a lot of folks were complaining that, oh, well, this is sort of a Hindu nationalist move. A lot of citizens that aren't ending up on this list are Muslims, even though they are Indian Muslims or people that have lived here their whole lives or families have been here. And Bangladesh is right next to Assam. So one of, one of the things in my mind that we need to think a little bit more about and drill down on is where you might start seeing some of these large scale population relocations. And it seems like Bangladesh and India might be one of these particularly volatile places. And the last time you had, you know, uh, big political issues in Bangladesh arguably was in the early seventies. And that was, you know, catastrophic. There, there was basically, basically a genocide that happened. Now at the time, India w was basically on East Pakistan's side. So it's a little bit different, but what do you think about that particular issue, Bangladesh and large scale movements of populations? No, I think you're exactly right. I think you're going to start seeing those types of, of population movements, but in some ways, you know, what happens in the Indian subcontinent is often contained in the Indian subcontinent. I mean, there's not, you know, for those countries in that area, for countries like a Bangladesh, uh, like a Myanmar, India itself, even a little bit of Pakistan, you know, a lot of bad things I think could happen inside there, but it's also kind of hemmed in, right? Like it can't really go outside of that. Um, but another country that I think about a lot in terms of especially water pollution, but just pollution and, and these types of things in general is China. I mean, I think there's something, I remember reading some crazy statistic from Chinese government standards that said that 85% of the water in its major rivers was undrinkable and something like 60% of it was, you know, so polluted that it wouldn't be able to be used for any other purpose. Um, it, it's funny to me that, you know, in the United States, there's a, a debate raging right now about, you know, uh, what did they call it? The, I think the Democrats had that thing called the Green New Deal that they were talking about and they wanted to cap emissions and all these aggressive things. But if you look at the, the rhetoric coming out of the Chinese Communist Party, one of the things that China has declared war on besides poverty, which is an issue we think about a lot in terms of China, especially here at GPF, is pollution and about what's going on with Chinese climate and about China's not just, and this goes just beyond water and about pollution as well. Um, you know, we have written about and talked about a lot lately just about China's food security, right? When you start thinking about the spread of African swine fever, which I wrote about, and when you start thinking about the spread of army worm, which you wrote about, and when you start thinking about how China's going to have to start importing more and more food and more and more water and more and more oil, and you're going to see internal migration inside of China as people try to get away from places that maybe are too polluted or that need time to, to recover. You know, if you, if you just look over the Himalayas and you look at China, which is a country that many people think is primed for sort of a position, a powerful position geopolitically in the world, China has some of these issues too. I think the difference, the interesting and different thing about China is that the central government has shown itself to be up to the task of maintaining them and of combating them so far. And when the Chinese feel like they have a problem, let's say the Chinese feel like they need to move a river, right? Or they need to move a city that is on a river so that they can dam the river and do something with it, right? They move the city. A lot of people are put out. and But, you know, China, at least so far, the government still has control. The countries that you're talking about just now, like a Bangladesh or an India or some of these other countries in the, in the subcontinent, they don't have that kind of control. And it's, a, it's a really a question about whether, you know, how bad does the situation have to get before the government is able to combat these sort of things. I would also point out that you know, one, of the one of the reasons that 
this part of the world that we've been talking about, and this includes Iran, it also includes India, Pakistan, you know, Bangladesh, um, climate and geography has always been difficult there, right? I think a lot of the things that we're talking about are just exacerbating issues that were already there. We've written a lot about some of the structural impediments in India in terms of their political system. China's is more authoritarian, and you just mentioned how that can sometimes actually be an aid in terms of allowing China to respond more quickly and on a greater scale to some of these large problems. Do you? Th- how much do you think the political system plays a role in that? And do you think that that seeming advantage that China has now will continue to be an advantage in the future, or will it backfire at some point? It's a good question, and I think it actually explains some of what's going on in both countries. So I rate China's capacity to deal with these kinds of issues far beyond India's. Um, I think it's kind of, you know, the people who said that China was a rising power, and now that China is a regional power, now people are starting to look at, well, okay, well, what are the other countries? And India looks like an obvious case. When you start thinking about the fact that large swaths of India's population doesn't even have access to running water that is sanitary to use, it's like, okay, like how can you possibly start talking about a country projecting any kind of serious power uh, in, in economic, political, or military terms if it doesn't even have water at home? That's not the issue of China today, right? A lot of the issues that China is dealing with today, it is dealing with because its central government basically made a deal with the devil. China in 1950 was basically an unindustrialized nation. It was basically the same as China was in 1850. And China decided that it was going to use its resources at home. And China historically is a country that has enough resources to take care of its domestic population. But so it used those resources in such a way that it could become powerful and become more industrialized and join the global economy in a sophisticated way. And the cost was, at a certain point down the road, they were going to have to start looking outside themselves because they were going to have to use up some of their resources and then they'd have to begin to import things. I think the second thing, though, to make here is, or the second comparison to make with China and India is this. Um, China today is much more ethnically homogenous uh, than maybe it was in the past. There is a really defined sense of what it means to be Chinese, and Chinese nationalism is a real thing. I think it's maybe arguably stronger than communism and the Communist Party, all these other things. I think Chinese nationalism is a really, really powerful force. And when you start thinking about the Chinese nation, uh, you know they went through a lot of depredations and embarrassments from foreign powers for a long time, and they've gone through a lot to get to the position that they're in. And I think even though there isn't a tremendous amount of you know, factional infighting within China, there is also a sense that there is a common cause that everybody has to join up to and that there are certain things that have to be done for the greater good. You can't talk about that with India in any particular way. Now, I think that Narendra Modi, who just won another election, would like to. And I think that you are seeing in India a rise in articulating, you know, whether it's Hindu nationalism or something else, you are beginning to see people try and articulate some kind of ideology that they can use to try and make India a more unified system. The issue, though, is that it isn't. And the water issue, again, is a really interesting one, right? Because, again, if China sees an issue with water inside the country, and it definitely has one, what the central government decides gets implemented for the most part. That's the way the Chinese Communist Party works. That's the way the central government in China works. Whereas in India, you have these pie in the sky plans, one of which I talked about, about interlinking Indian rivers. But how about just basic plans about cleaning up some of the sanitation in these rivers or making sure that people aren't diverting water from one place to the other or that you don't have gangs running around in water uh, insecure zones that sell water to the people at hugely high cost. In India, the central government can't say something and then accomplish it because the Indian government is actually trying to be a referee for water conflicts between different states who are trying to screw the state next to it over so that it can have better access to water. So look, both China and, uh, both China and India have tremendous problems when it comes to water, and both are going to see those problems, I think, be exacerbated by population growth, by industrialization, by urbanization, and by climate change. Uh, but China stands to be in a much more privileged situation to deal with that, even though I think if you just looked at it resource, square mile per square mile, India would have more in, in the sense of a resource. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, look, we've been talking now for a while, and I'm sure our listeners can only take so much water talk. But Xander, I also wanted to put to you, we've been talking a lot about the Middle East and, and Asia, these sorts of issues, but it's hard to have a conversation about water in the world today. <laughs> 
and not talk about what's going on in the Arctic. Um, so I wonder if you would just kind of lay out maybe how you think about, how, well, uh, take that as you will. Let's, let's give you a blank canvas. What do you think about uh, how the Arctic is affecting some of these dynamics that we talked about and maybe the stability of some of the countries like a Russia or a Canada that are connected to the Arctic? Sure. Well, just the, the simple background here is as global temperatures rise and as we see more ice melting and glacial melting in the north, there are going to be new passageways in the Arctic that didn't exist before that will allow for the transport of all sorts of things along shorter routes than previously existed. And you wrote a great piece about this. I think it was almost two years ago now, maybe back in 2017, it was a deep dive like towards the geopolitics of the Arctic. And I think it's going to bring up a lot of the issues that we face all over the world in terms of different sorts of supply routes. There will be, you know, geopolitical concepts like choke points will probably apply in certain areas. And, you know, UN law of the sea, who controls what part of the Arctic Ocean will come into play. And a lot of these, these issues that are, hot, you know, pressing topics in different parts of the world, but just haven't applied to the Arctic will begin to as the value of these routes and the value of any sorts of energy reserves, maybe that are found up in that area come into play and begin to attach a value to different regions within the Arctic. So I think we will begin to see a lot of the geopolitical issues that we tend to cover and all the other parts of the world become more relevant as more ice melts up there. But, you know, I know this is something that you looked into. This is, this doesn't seem imminent. It's not happening like next week, right? Like a lot of these passages won't even be fully traversable until I think 2050, right? The, the estimates, some estimates will tell you that, some estimates will tell you 10 years and, you know, the, the rate of certainty on those estimates is really variable. It's one of the reasons that makes it so hard to talk about climate change. But let's even take an aggressive viewpoint of, of how long it would take for, for it to be navigable throughout the entire year and that you wouldn't have to outfit your ships with special types of, you know, even if it's open, you know, if it's still really cold, you're, you're going to usually have to outfit your ships in order to get through that. But let's say for the sake of argument that a lot of that Arctic ice melts faster than people are anticipating and the trade routes are open. I don't think of that as that much of a fundamental change in terms of how geography is working in the world. I think the more pressing issue, and this is one that I've looked into less, is whether climate change creates a scenario where more people are living on the shores of the Arctic Ocean. Because you know, right now, okay, like if the Arctic routes are open, you might see trade routes that are shorter and you might see some competition for those trade routes that, and the choke points would definitely be there, but it wouldn't actually fundamentally change any sense of the balance of power. And fundamentally, like nobody lives on the Arctic Ocean, right? Like there's just nobody living up there. If that changed, if you had sort of, let's say that, you know, habitable zones in the world are changing and let's say that places, you know, closer to the equator become less hospitable, but places closer to the Arctic become more hospitable due to weather. And let's say a hundred years from now, you start having large scale cities or human communities or developments on the Arctic Ocean. Well, yeah, then I could, if you just look at the Arctic Ocean on, on a map, you can go on our website. I think we created a great series of maps based on this. The Arctic Ocean kind of looks like the Mediterranean Sea in the sense that it's surrounded by a discrete number of countries and there are choke points in and out. And the Mediterranean in history has been a locus of conflict precisely because there have been such major population centers that are competing with each other across this sea, right? I think the Arctic really becomes transformational in terms of geography and not just a faster way to trade with something if you have people, if, if it becomes possible to start living on the Arctic itself. Uh, and that, yeah, I mean, we're probably a long way away from that, but that's the interesting thing about climate. I mean, a lot of the stuff can happen faster than people anticipate. Sometimes it can happen slower than people anticipate and sometimes not at all. That's what makes it one of the most difficult issues for people like us to answer because, you know, I feel like so, so often what we're trying to figure out is the things that don't change, right? And the thing with climate is that it's really hard, even if you're a scientist, even if you devote your life to the ins and outs of every particular issue, it's really hard to say with any degree of certainty exactly how things are going to change. And that puts us in the difficult place of, you know, we want to be forward thinking and predictive. But when it comes to the climate, you sort of 
have to be a little bit reactive because the moment you start saying you know what's going to happen with a particular river or a particular ocean like the Arctic, you're really leaving the bounds of certainty. You're really just doing guesswork, even if it is educated guesswork. Yeah, and sort of to compound that, part of the problem is timing. So timing and scale. So even if you know that there are going to be some effects, such as sea level rises, how much and when becomes a challenge because when they occur will impact what sorts of political issues they're intersecting at that particular moment in time, right? Um, and I, I do want to be fair to all of our listeners out there in Svalbard. There is already a population center in the Arctic. Yeah, sorry, Svalbard listeners. Uh, hope you all have gotten your subscriptions, though. You should uh, continue signing up up there. But yeah, but and I mean, just to bring it home and to bring it back to where we started, this is why for me it's so frustrating and in some ways so fear inducing to talk about climate and geopolitics and all these other things. And I've decided I'm not going to care anymore and I'm just going to talk about it openly. But I think you have felt this too. The moment you even use the word climate these days, People are trying to peg you down about what political policies you might be implement, might be open to implementing, or who, what politicians you might support, or what that means about your worldview. And again, like the the issues that are happening, whether they're man made or not, um, look like there's climate change happening. There has always been climate change. There have always been, uh, you know, the the world is a beautiful place, but it's also an incredibly dangerous place. One of the fundamental aspects of human civilization is about harnessing the environment around you and making it do things that are in the benefit of human beings and not just being you know, subject to a monsoon or a drought or a hurricane. You try and bend your environment around you to your will, and that's what, in some sense what it means to be human. And it's crazy to me that we are having such monumental changes and the level of political discourse on maybe how to think about those changes, on how to alleviate or take advantage or do any of these other things with these changes, it often, especially in, in Western countries, I would say, gets wrapped up in this political conversation where people are talking about their political differences through a thing, climate change, which is really, really important and which is going to affect hundreds of millions, if not billions of human beings. And there's, there's just something lost in translation there. And I, I don't know how to get through it besides just beginning to talk about it. For sure. And I, I think as just an indicator of the apolitical aspect of this particular issue, you can look at entities like the U.S. Navy or the Russian Navy beginning to invest more in icebreakers and developing a more focused policy on the Arctic as a result of ice melt. I mean, that's it just goes beyond partisanship, right? It is something that is happening. It is something that some of the more powerful organizations in the world are beginning to think about a lot more seriously. So we should too. And that, you know, that I guess about wraps up this podcast. It's definitely something that we plan to focus a little bit more on and hope you enjoyed listening to me and Jacob try to talk through some of the things on our mind, you know, in a sort of open-ended way, because that's that's how we begin to drill into these issues is with a dialectic. And I'm sorry I use the word dialectic. I promise never to do it again, but not really. All right. Thank you for listening, everyone. I'm Jacob Shapiro. That was Xander Snyder. We will be back with you. Well, I don't know if we will be back with you, but somebody from GPF will be back with you next week uh, to give you another podcast. In the meantime, please send us all your comments, even if you think that we're missing all the ways in which climate change is really just a conspiracy for some unknown group to control the world. And we'll see you out there.